Good evening and welcome to our webinar, OCD and Tourette Syndrome, a primer for parents and families. My name is Angela Sullivan, Medical Project Specialist, and I will be your moderator for this evening. This webinar is being provided as part of the Tourette Health and Education Program, a program of the Tourette Association of America in partnership with the CDC. During tonight's webinar, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I would like to mention that funding for this webinar was made possible by our cooperative agreement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views expressed by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does the mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. So before we get started this evening, I wanted to take a few minutes to share some information about the Tourette Association of America. Can you go to the next slide, please? At the Tourette Association, we are dedicated to making life better for all people affected by Tourette syndrome and tick disorders through efforts that raise awareness, advance research and understanding, and of course, provide support. Next slide. Awareness, research, and support comprise the three main pillars of an organization, and through these, we are able to provide our community with many resources. Through social media, public relations, and news placement, as well as our youth ambassadors located across the country, we're able to raise awareness of Tourette syndrome. This is also done through advocacy and lobbying on Capitol Hill for continued funding. For, by providing grants and fellowships to both young investigators and other professionals, we're able to advance research and provide clinical trials on Tourette syndrome and new treatment options. The TAA has a network of chapters and support groups across the country that provide support at the state level for their communities. And in addition to this, programs at the, at the TAA, such as online support groups, webinars like the one you'll hear today, the biennial conference and in-person presentations, we provide support to our constituents. Next slide. Lastly, I wanted to mention that our partnership with the CDC has also allowed us to create an abundance of in-print resources. We have toolkits available for all members of our community, including providers, children, young adults, families, and most recently, we've created a toolkit for law enforcement. All of these resources are available on our website in PDF form. However, they can also be mailed to you if needed. So with that said, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Dr. Erica Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg is a child and adolescent psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital and an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She is the director of the Pediatric Psychiatry OCD and Tick Disorders Program at MGH and is a co-director of the Tourette Association of America, MGH Center of Excellence. Her interests include Tourette syndrome, OCD, Tourette OCD, ADHD, and body-focused repetitive behavior disorders. She is the primary investigator on a study evaluating a behavioral treatment for those with tick disorders and ADHD, and has authored several peer-reviewed manuscripts for TS, OCD, and related disorders. Dr. Greenberg graduated from Wild Cornell Medical College and completed her general psychiatry residency at Harvard Longwood and her child adolescent fellowship training at Mass General McLean, where she served as chief, chief resident in both programs. Without further ado, Dr. Greenberg, please go ahead with your presentation. Uh, welcome everyone tonight. Thank you for listening. Uh, in terms of disclosures, I have no financial disclosures. I will be talking about treatments that are not FDA approved and uh, many of which are off label. I'll intend to use generic names versus brand names when discussing medicine. And I'll try to clarify whether um, any points I'm giving are secondary to current research or more um, experience based in this uh, particular Tourette OCD field. So in terms of what I'm gonna talk about tonight, I'm first gonna speak about OCD in its typical presentation, some of the background, the science behind it, typical treatment options. And then I'm gonna focus on early onset OCD uh, and then focus on OCD with tics and or teretic OCD. Oftentimes the early onset OCD and the OCD with tics overlap. And finally, I'm gonna to try to separate complex ticks from compulsions, how to determine whether it's more of a tick or a compulsion, 
and from other behaviors often seen in those with Tourette and or um, Tourette OCD. So what is OCD? Up until 2013, it was characterized as an anxiety disorder, but um, with the new DSM, the Diagnostic uh, Manual in Psychiatry, it was placed in the obsessive compulsive and related disorders, along with other disorders that have repetitive components. And it was also moved from the anxiety disorder um, spectrum conditions because while oftentimes it is associated with the anxiety, it doesn't necessarily have to be a key feature of OCD. Um, so other um, disorders in the obsessive compulsive related disorder chapter are body dysmorphic disorder, hoarding disorder, and trichotillomania and excoriation disorder, hair pulling and skin picking disorder respectively. And those are known as body-focused repetitive behavior disorders. And so OCD is characterized by the presence of obsessions and or compulsions. Obsessions are intrusive, unwanted, and or disturbing images, thoughts, urges that then lead to feelings of anxiety and distress uh, or sometimes disgust and or sometimes a feeling of just not right. They occur over and over again. And when we're speaking about children and adults for that matter, outside of their control, they pop in. Similarly, or, or oppositely, compulsions are a the behavior that the individual feel that they have to do with the intention of getting rid of that obsession, that unwanted feeling that was caused by the obsession. Other times people will have compulsions in order to stop something bad from happening. Um, so for example, having to tap something three times to prevent an accident. Um, and often in compulsions, it will either be excessive or not connected realistically to um, what something might be designed to, pre uh, to prevent. So for example, if you tap something three times, it won't actually necessarily prevent an accident, but when you are doing that, you believe that you are getting, that's a way to get rid of that obsessive, um, intrusive feeling. Oftentimes, especially in kids, uh, parents will say that they don't see any compulsions, that you know they might be having thoughts stuck in their head, but there's not necessarily any compulsion. And sometimes, or very often, that's because there's an avoidant part of it, where if the child is afraid that they, um, might touch something sticky and then get really upset, they will just avoid all sticky things. And so you don't necessarily see the behaviors that would happen secondary to the obsession. Oftentimes in children too, they can't articulate the aims. And so you might ask them why they're doing what they're doing um, and they won't know and that's okay. That doesn't mean that that's different from OCD. So in order to meet criteria, again, you have to have either obsessions and or compulsions, and they have to be time consuming, meaning it needs to take at least an hour a day, and it needs to cause some degree of clinical impairment or distress. Many people will have symptoms of OCD, so people who say that they don't like to touch um, doors, leaving bathrooms, they don't like to touch sticky things, but they don't get in the way and they don't take up a lot of time and they don't necessarily cause distress. And in those cases, depending on that, they're either referred to obsessive compulsive symptoms or subclinical OCD, but to have a real obsessive compulsive disorder diagnosis, it has to meet that criteria of the at least an hour and the impairment and distress. And then um, there's a few different specifiers that one adds to it. So the first one is insight. In children, insight isn't necessarily expected to be intact. So most adults with OCD are able to say that whatever their, um, you know, the, the intrusive thought and then the resulting compulsion, that they don't think the compulsion will really prevent this bad thing from happening, but maybe it will, but it probably doesn't. So there, there's insight. They realize that it doesn't necessarily make sense, but they still feel like they have to do it. That's good insight. Poor insight is when the individual really believes that, that these thoughts are true and that the compulsions associated with them are probably true. And then absent insight, um, and this is when it gets more into um, whether or not it sounds more delusional, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. Um, that's when someone is completely convinced that OCD beliefs are true. In children, this is less of something that we focus on because in general, insight is less strong in kids. 
And it also should be noted that insight changes, especially in kids, depending on their level of anxiety. And so if you ask them when they're not in the middle of um, having obsessive compulsive thoughts, whether um, you know whether they really do think that they'll <clears throat> um, there'll be a fire in the house if they don't touch every doorknob, um, they'll say no, no, that's not true. But if push comes to shove, and um, and it gets closer to them being in a situation where they think it might come true, they they will feel like they have to do it, and in that moment they might lose insight. That's pretty typical. The other specifier, and this is what we're going to focus on a lot more tonight, is whether or not it's tick related. And, um, and that's because up to about 25% of kids that have OCD will also have ticks and or tick spectrum disorder. <clears throat> it's also really important to clarify that just because, um, you know, when people say in, in, in colloquial terms, oh, I'm so OCD, they often are meaning they like things very neat and straight and, and organized and um, like things a certain way. And, and just like that, you know, there it's everything is on a spectrum. And so it's important not to characterize things that are normal behavior as OCD. So rituals in children are definitely normal to a degree. So oftentimes around meals, bedtimes, they can have rituals, um, especially when kids are younger up through um, late elementary school, it can help develop a sense of mastery and control of their environment. Um, oftentimes, and here's a picture of a baseball team with kids with rally caps on. Um, it can be, you know, something that maybe, you know, they believe or they believe in the moment, but once it's over, it it's easy to put away, easy to put aside, doesn't cause um, distress. Um, and so often people will say they have to wear their lucky shirt, their lucky socks, they can't wash them for the season. That, um, depending on what else is going on, that could all be construed as normal. And this is a chart that I really like. Um, the link is Below, and I believe it's also on the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry practice parameters, just helping to distinguish what is OCD versus what is normal child behavior. Um, as a rule, normal child behavior doesn't cause impairment in family functioning, and an interruption of it doesn't create severe distress in the child. Other things that you might see with OCD is that over time, it becomes increasingly um, bizarre where you can still follow the logic, but it's not rational and uh, might become more elaborate, more demanding. <clears throat> and if it's not done exactly correct, it might have to be repeated. Those are the sorts of things that, um, especially as they take up more time, you wouldn't necessarily see in normal development. And, and this is also over a period of time. So, so you'll be seeing this for weeks, months versus, you know, a day here and there. And so what are the obsessions and compulsions one normally sees? So oftentimes in adults, uh, when someone hears OCD, they think of someone who washes their hands over and over again. And while that's definitely an OCD um, symptom, that is by far not the only one. And um, certain other ones in kids are as equally common. So oftentimes you can divide the obsessions and compulsions into four different factors, and that's how they factor out during various factor analysis that they do for research in this. So one factor is contamination. Um, so worried that they are gonna get, <clears throat> uh, touch something and then gonna get sick, it's dirty. Uh, excuse me, and the resulting compulsions for that, washing, cleaning, grooming, so that's one. The next factor is symmetry. And so these are where kids will say that um, something has to feel just right. Or, um, or more symmetric. So I'll often ask if you touch one side of your arm, do you have to touch the other arm? And kids might say yes. Um, that's associated with repeating, redoing. These are the kids that in school, if they write a letter incorrectly, they'll have to um, wipe it out and rewrite it. Ordering, arranging, counting, um, touching, tapping, uh, and skipping ahead a bit, but I'm gonna talk about this a lot more in depth. This is one of the factors that's more associated with the OCD scene in Tourette. Another category, uh, another factor is forbidden thoughts. And this is another one that's more often seen in kids, adolescents, and adults uh, with a more Tourettic OCD. And um, these are the ones that, uh, you know, intrusive thoughts of bad things happening or aggressive thoughts. What if I push someone off a ledge? What if I jump off a ledge? Um, scrupulosity, what if I said a bad word or think it and I'm gonna go to hell? Um, sexual thoughts, other perverse quote unquote forbidden thoughts. And whoops, 
And it's important to note that, um, so a common thought, um, a common forbidden thought is in, often in the sexual realm. And it used to be uh, if someone was would have intrusive thoughts, what if what if they're gay? What if they're bisexual? What if they're lesbian? It's it's the point of it is that it has to be disturbing. So for a child, adolescent that does identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, that thought is an OCD. They might have a thought of what if I'm straight. So it's it's something that feels wrong. Um, a word that we often use in OCD that separates it from other conditions is ego dystonic. Ego, I, dystonic, bad. It's something that doesn't feel like yourself. So these are intrusive thoughts that don't make sense and don't feel right, that they then try to get out of their heads with the compulsions, but the more they try to get rid of it, the stronger it is. So for this one, this forbidden thoughts, often you'll see a lot of checking. So going to the parent, are you sure I didn't push someone down? Are you, are you sure I'm not gonna hurt myself? Or a lot of reassurance seeking, a lot of confessing over and over and over and a lot of apologizing. Um, the final category that we don't focus as much on, or I'm not, I'm not gonna focus as much on on this talk is hoarding, um, which tends to be a little bit different from the other three. So again, it's contamination, um, the forbidden thoughts, and then the symmetry um, counting category. You can have symptoms in any of them or, or one of them. Um, it's, it's still all, OCD, oftentimes, once you are in one category, you're less likely to suddenly start developing some from a new category, but that definitely still happens. There's lots of other symptoms. They just don't factor as well onto each, any of these um, in these four groups, or they might be in both the groups. And these are these um, uh, uh, fear of vomiting. So these are kids who can't hear the word vomit, um, or they become disgusted or fear that they'll get sick, hypochondriasis. Um, if they have a pain, they'll think it might be a rare bad illness. Um, those sorts of symptoms are all OCD related. So um, who and who does it affect? So it affects about two to three percent in children and adolescents. There's two onset periods, the early onset, which is predominantly what we're speaking about today, which is average age around 10 sometimes a little earlier in boys, prepubertal uh, pre boys, about peripubertal girls, so between the ages of eight and 12. And then the later onset is in uh, late teens, early adulthood. Um, the reason that the early onset is so important is a lot of um, studies are showing that while it overlaps with the late onset, it might have different genetics. And those of the early onset OCD are more linked to tick spectrum disorder conditions. And so therefore, those that have early onset more often have um, tick or tick disorders, tick-related illnesses, um, about, again, 25% or so. Those with early onset OCD are also uh, more likely, again, um, to have ticks, but to also have ADHD. That's um, oftentimes people think, like, how could someone have OCD and ADHD? You'd think they would be opposites. I'll explain why that's not the case in a moment. But um, rates of OCD, uh, uh, of ADHD, are a lot higher in this population compared to in a typical population, and also anxiety disorders. In general, if a child or adolescent has OCD, they are more likely than not to have another condition. Um, we call them comorbid conditions because you tend to see them together. That goes with it. And as I was just mentioning, um, uh, we believe that the early onset OCD, it tends to be more genetic or heritable, meaning um, more of it seems to be passed through genes compared to the adult onset. Not all of it, only about 50%, which means we're still trying to understand where the other 50% um, develops from, but it does tend to be more genetic. And we know that um, from the early 90s that OCD and Tourette have a lot of their genetics in common. So as I just mentioned, uh, a lot, if you have, if a child adolescent has OCD, it's important to look for other conditions to make sure they're not there. By far, not all kids or um, uh, will have all of these. It's just important to keep an eye out so that you don't uh, inadvertently miss something. So anxiety is pretty prevalent, 30% uh, or greater. Uh, ticks, hair pulling, skin picking, those other um, disorders in the OCD category. ADHD, and then also um, mood disorders to a degree. In general, in terms of the characteristics, 
of OCD, it tends to wax and wane over time. We know that stress makes it worse. We know that um, when you're sick, it can be worse. Tired, it gets worse. Um, excitement, it can sometimes get worse, but it, it, it might come and go independent of, um, of an, any outside condition that we're at least aware of. And um, the good news is that pediatric onset OCD tends to have a better prognosis uh, to a degree than adult onset OCD. And so when um, they did a pretty large study where they uh, evaluated kids and adolescents that had OCD between seven and 12 years later, about 50% 50, uh, 50 of them either had no or subclinical symptoms, um, uh, which, is, which is pretty good. We tend to think of it as, as a, a condition that can come and go and for periods of time be not present, but one would might always have that tendency towards. And so it's, it's helpful to know that um, you know, over about a decade or so, many kids that have it are doing pretty well. We also know that about two thirds to three fourths of the children that have OCD um, experience response with first line OCD treatments, which I'll talk about. Before I talk about that though, it would be helpful to talk about the pathophysiology um, fancy way of saying what we think is happening in the body that causes it to be the case. And so <clears throat> the presumed pathophysiology is dysfunction in a brain circuit. This brain circuit um, called frontocortical striatal thalamocortical circuit, CSTC for short, and I will stick with that, um, is implicated in OCD. And this circuit, um, when it's dysregulated, is basically leads to disinhibition. And um, it's implicated in a lot of the disorders that uh, we see that also occur with OCD. So in addition to OCD, this circuit disruption, we see in Tourette syndrome, tic disorders, um, body focused repetitive behavior disorders, ADHD, and um, also some executive dysfunction. And uh, a term that's often used now to think of it is, is impulsive compulsive disorders. Impulsive means inability to stop oneself from doing something that one wants, even though there'll be punishment, like I really want that extra cookie, so I'm gonna take it even though I know I shouldn't. Compulsive means trying to get rid of a negative feeling that's bothering you. So um, um, like with tics, uh, or sorry, not with tics, like with compulsions in, in OCD. So you have this intrusive thoughts really bothering, you do a ritual or a compulsion to try to get rid of it. Um, and both of those you see. And so basically the circuit is involved in regulating motor output, emotional experience, thinking and cognition. And so it's this disruption that leads to OCD symptoms, tic symptoms, ADHD symptoms, et cetera. Interestingly, um, so when I write affected transmit neurotransmitters, those are the neurotransmitters, the, the, um, the molecules that, that help the brain cells communicate, basically. And what we try to target in terms of the medications uh, when we're trying to help those with OCD. So serotonin is implicated in this circuit, and that's our best treatments right now. Uh, but glutamate is the one of the primary neurotransmitters in this target, and that's where a lot of the future uh, research in, in medicine for OCD is right now, although not, um, not nearly as effective yet so far as the serotonin ones. I also think it's helpful to, um, there's often a set of, of personality or, or characteristics and, and or dysfunctional beliefs that parents often describe and are um, um, known to exist in children and adolescents with OCD. And these include having this inflated sense of responsibility, like they feel they're responsible, they can cause or prevent negative uh, outcome situations. Something called thought action fusion, which is basically if, it's a, if it goes in their head, they think it's real. So you think it, it means it's true. Um, and part of the treatment is helping them defuse. Um, overestimating threat, so feeling like things that are negative are going to be more probable, uh, perfectionistic and, and rigid, so this black and white thinking, pervasive doubt, so just this constant feeling of not being sure, uh, and sometimes this will express as like, I don't know if I took that person's pen, maybe I did, did I steal it? 
Um, and then finally, inability to tolerate uncertainty, often described as they need to know. So constantly asking clarifying questions to try to get all the details. In terms of treatment options, there are two mainstays of treatment. Behavioral therapy and this cartoon, Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes, and the dark, which is um, pretty funny. And also a shout out to Dr. Barbara Coffey, who often uses this on her slides. And then psychopharmacology, fancy way of saying medicine. So the main um, therapy that you really, really want for, to treat OCD is a behavioral therapy. It's a type of um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, called exposure response prevention, ERP. And um, what it does is, although it sounds paradoxical, the goal is to slowly and, and trust, you know, with a trusted provider, expose oneself to the disturbing thoughts, images, and situations that lead to the distress that make one want to do the compulsion or avoid, and then response prevention, committing to not engage in that compulsive behavior. Very hard, um, sort of, and, and this is where I'm talking about insight suddenly lessens as soon as the child is asked to not engage in the compulsive behavior. But over time, it's been proven um, that this is a, a, um, a really, really, really helpful way to help um, lessen, get rid of OCD symptoms. Uh, the exact mechanism isn't entirely clear. It's thought possibly to believe that you habituate over time. So as, as you get used to it, the anxiety fades. Or another possibility is that one is learning how to tolerate that distress and then once they know they can tolerate, that ultimately leads to the reduction in anxiety. And there's an example of the type of fear ladder that's often constructed in ERP on the left-hand side. So you develop this hierarchy and you slowly work up. A cognitive piece of it is often working with the child or adolescent to figure out, uh, to help them determine what is them and what is OCD. So if you remember that OCD is that ego dystonic, it's helping them say, was that a thought that Erica had, or was that a OCD intrusive thought? Um, and so that's the main behavioral therapy. In terms of medications for kids, uh, in terms of the FDA approved ones, it's fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, clomipramine, and um, I believe those three. Either way, what we know about FDA approval, unfortunately, is, is it's not always um, necessarily what is the most effective treatment. In OCD, it, it is, but not necessarily in other conditions. Either way, almost all of the SSRIs are first line treatments for OCD. And so any of these are often used. That said, um, providers tend, or child adolescent providers should stay away from paroxetine as it tends to have the most side effects. Um, but otherwise, and, and citalopram, for reasons I won't get into on this webinar, can be sometimes tricky to use because of a warning on it. But escitalopram, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, sertraline are all um, very helpful in treating OCD. Um, sometimes people will say that you have to use fluvoxamine because it has that OCD indication. It's just as good as any of the others. It's just that it can combine with clomipramine in a synergistic way. And so if you use clomipramine, it's better, but on its own, fluvoxamine is not any more effective than the other ones. So this has the start, um, the dose range that you often target. It's known that in OCD, you often need to use higher doses than you might in treating anxiety or depression. So you're often at the upper end of the dose range and, and often and not often, um, not uncommonly, even above it um, some of the time. And with children, adolescents tend to start low, go slow meaning for citalopram, one might start at five milligrams, uh, fluoxetine, five milligrams, sertraline, I've started at 12.5 milligrams, especially in those that are younger. And um, one can titrate relatively quickly. The main thing to watch out for is, is side effects. And in general, side effects with SSRIs, so sorry, these are all SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, except for clomipramine, that's in a different category. It's a, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, all of them tend to have mild side effects. Nausea, um, uh, possibly sleep changes, possibly. They tend to be overall weight neutral. Some kids might gain weight, some kids might lose weight. 
um, they're, they're placebo-like side effects. When people take placebo in comparison, the side effects you see with placebo are pretty similar. One that we do watch out for, especially in those that are um, prepubertal, is something called activation, which is not in itself dangerous, but this is when kids might get more silly, edgy, activated when you increase a dose that often goes away if it's mild over the next few days. And that's something that you watch for with every change and um, do one's best to avoid by going very slowly, especially in those younger kids. As kids get older, that tends to happen less and less. And um, while it can be, um, while it can mean that you cannot, well, a child can't tolerate a medicine because they got too activated, that is different from bipolar disorder. And so that's important to get across also. Um, we also speak about how long you should be on the medicine. That's a question I get frequently, which makes a lot of sense. What the research shows is one really wants to have all the symptoms gone before one stops. So if one stops, but there's still symptoms, there's a greater chance of relapse than if one stops after the symptoms are gone. And one wants to wait at least six months, more likely a year before withdrawing the medicine in order to have the best chance of not having relapse. In general, safe, effective, and can be very, very helpful, but it just makes sense to think through with one's provider whether it makes sense for any one child, and I'll get into the guidelines in a moment. So a landmark study um, was the POTS study, Pediatric OCD Treatment Study, back in 2004. And what this study was looking at was whether um, the behavioral therapy, uh, at least one component of that being the exposure response, or the medicine, sertraline, was chosen, the combination of behavioral therapy and sertraline, or placebo alone, was most effective in helping these kids. And so it was over 100 kids aged 7 to 17 with um, moderate and greater OCD symptoms. In the behavioral therapy, it was about three months with education, exposure response, relapse prevention, other cognitive strategies. And again, sertraline, it was a um, uh, fixed flexible titration scale. So you would start between 25 and 50 and each week over six weeks increase up to 200, um, only stopping if there was adverse effects. And that is often how we titrate it. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily weight-based, not necessarily age-based. It, it's whether it's effective or not and or whether there's side effects. If there's side effects, you stop it or lower it. If it's helping and there are not side effects, it's more helpful to go up because again, unless the symptoms are gone, um, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense then to, to stop the medicine. And so what they found was that overall, the combined group did the best. Um, so the combination of medicine and um, CBT worked well. That said, um, so the com so combination was better than sertraline, which was better, um, but CBT and combined didn't completely separate. So even though that percent is larger in terms of how many kids went below the threshold on, on the Y box, a measure below 11, those didn't statistically separate. So when we think about starting treatment, and again, I'll get into this in a second, the, the, main, the main guidelines is the first thing you want to do is start CBT. Um, that said, if one has severe enough symptoms, then starting with the combination can be, uh, would be most effective and what's recommended. So CBT effective, combined effective, both of those more effective than sertraline alone, and CBT and sertraline alone were both more effective than placebo. So the numbers are, are to a degree, um, um, humbling in that that was what it took for remission. However, in terms of reduction of symptoms, there was a greater response. And so you can see on the figure on the right um, where they started in their CY box. So um, that's around, you know, moderate, severe, and then where they um, where they ended, and that's again where you can see the combined showed um, that most improvement in CY box. Although in terms of um, the actual numbers who met remission, um, CBT and combined were not statistically different. However, as I'm sure most of you are acutely aware, it is very, very, very difficult to find a CBT provider, and so they did a follow-up study to see. 
um, whether for the kids that were started on SSI uh, search for lean alone, but were only partial responders, whether adding CBT could be effective. Um, and they compared that to whether the provider, the medication provider, just gave instructions on CBT or whether they just continued the antidepressant. And it was clear that augmenting with the regular CBT, again, now this being a combined treatment, was significantly more effective than the, med um, the person giving medications, just telling instructions on it or just staying with the antidepressant alone. So in terms of treatment takeaways, the first line should, should always be CBT, uh, ERP, and not just the instructions, real CBT. Um, for SSRIs, it should be about a three-month trial with at least eight weeks at a maximum dose. It used to be thought that it took um, two months to get to the effective, uh, to see any benefit from SSRIs. Now we actually know that in OCD, you'll see the biggest improvements for any dose within the first two to three weeks, and then it'll continue for another um, up to two or three months. But if you're not seeing that big change within the first two or three weeks, it does make sense to increase the dose. And then, like I just said, again, when the CY box, that measurement, is greater than 24, and this is, is per the um, child adolescent psychiatry practice parameter guidelines, um, so now symptoms are severe, um, time, distress, severe limitations, you want to start with the combination therapy. Oftentimes, what we speak about with kids with OCD is that the medication allows them to access the therapy more, so if they're just too, if the insight drops too far, they just feel too, 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 too anxious to do the exposures, medicine can allow them to tolerate doing some of the exposures. Um, well, briefly, I'll just touch on um, some factors that do affect one's response to medicine. And so this is one of the takeaways from this presentation today, which is that if one has co-occurring tics, it's possible that SSRIs alone are less effective. So in that other study, I spoke about the POTS study, when they looked at kids that had um, OCD and tics, sertraline didn't end up separating from placebo. That doesn't mean for any one kid, it might be very, very effective, but it's something to think about if an SSRI alone isn't working as well for a child that has OCD and tics. Um, in terms of things that can augment and have been proven to augment atypical neuroleptic, that's a fancy way of saying atypical antipsychotic, that's the medicines like risperidone and uh, aripiprazole. Those have both been shown to be effective in treating OCD um, with tics that wasn't responsive to an SSRI alone. Um, other factors that make it SSRI may be less likely, hoarding, poor insight, and family accommodation. And this is something I often try to talk about. It's often very well intentioned. So, um, you know, providing reassurance, um, letting the child avoid doing what's gonna evoke that fear. But this leads to negative reinforcement and, and it actually un unfortunately causes a lot of family impairment, distress, anxiety, um, uh, mood conditions in the parents. So we, we work with parents too, to help with that. Um, as I just mentioned, so with OCD, if there are tics, poor insight, autism spectrum, and or severe, not mild, severe mood instability, um, augmenting with haloperidol, risperidone, aripiprazole are all shown to be helpful. I haven't talked about clomipramine yet. Clomipramine is actually the most effective serotonergic agent we have for OCD. However, um, it can be associated or it is associated with potential more side effects and so we don't use it as a first line option. And lots of other possibilities but none as effective as the serotonergic agents, um, at least as of yet. So now moving into tic disorders and OCD. So what we know is that in Tourette syndrome, 30 to 60 percent of um, those that have it will meet criteria for OCD and this is compared to two to 3% in the general population, much, much, much more common. And that doesn't even include those that have OC symptoms or subclinical. Conversely, in OCD, we know that about 30% will have tick or tick disorders, and that's versus up to two to 3% in the general population. Um, what we know is that in those that have Tourette and OCD, there does tend to often be more severe ticks. 
And then um, those children, adolescents that have Tourette and OCD are also more at risk for other comorbid conditions, um, anxiety, depression. And um, I'm often asked whether the symptoms that one has an OCD versus this tick-related OCD differ. And uh, the answer is yes. So when someone with tick disorder has OCD, um, uh, or if they have OCD with ticks, they are more likely to have those two categories that we spoke about, the symmetry and the, um, uh, the um, bad thoughts. So um, in terms of obs uh, obsession, you'll have more symmetry, aggression, um, and then the compulsions, you'll see more of this checking, touching, writing, symmetry, and a lot of what they describe as not just right. I, I have to do it until it feels just right. Um, we also know that tick-related OCD, when they do it genetically, it actually looks more similar to Tourette syndrome than to OCD without ticks. And um, so that's something that is, is helpful to think about, especially because in Tourette syndrome, as I'm sure many of you are aware, you often have a lot of those other comorbid conditions. And so um, it, it's more thinking of OCD as, as basically just part of this Tourette syndrome spectrum disorder, that, that circuitry, that CSTC circuitry that I spoke about. Um, and really interestingly, it's, there's been recent evidence that um, the, the symptom of symmetry and exactness is actually, even though we ask about it when looking for OCD, it's more associated with Tourette, both clinically and genetically than with OCD. And so there's this terminology, Tourettic OCD, that I use a lot, um, that others use often, coined by um, Dr. Mansueto around 2005. So Tourettic OCD, and I, I bet this will be familiar to a lot of you, is associated with um, male sex, earlier age of OCD onset. So these kids might start to have OCD around age seven, eight, nine, more OCD impairment, anxiety, also sensory, um, hypersensitivity from an early age, attentional difficulties, ADHD, learning disorders, impulsivity, body focus, repetitive behaviors, the skin picking, hair pulling, and anxiety and depression. I should be very, very clear. It doesn't mean that if you have that, you are gonna have all of those. It just means that in general, those are more frequently seen in this Tourette OCD grouping than in a more general population. And they also tend to have these more not just right feelings. And so they'll describe more of the sensory phenomenon, um, feeling of incompleteness that drives the symptoms. And it's tricky because when you treat it um, and you say like, well, what are you afraid of about touching you know, this, this again, a sticky substance, and they won't say they're afraid something bad is hap of happening. They'll say like, I just can't do it, I'll explode. And I've heard that um, over and over. And so that makes it really tricky to treat on um, using exposure response when it's, what are you afraid of? It becomes maybe more needing to use more of a habit reversal, um, which might be more about um, doing a competing response or, um, changing around the environment or learning how to tolerate that distress associated with that discomfort. And so it can be really difficult to separate out what's a tick, what's a compulsion. So an easy solution is sometimes what's driving the behavior. So if it's like a thinking um, or an anxiety that you want to get rid of, again, those obsessions, it could be a compulsion. If it's more of a feeling or a sensory, uh, might be more likely to be a tick. Um, and just as obsession comes prior to compulsion, that premonitory urge sensation that a lot of kids with Tourette report comes prior to the tick, but sometimes it's in the middle. So a lot of uh, children, adolescents will report having to stomp their foot, maybe in multiples of three until it feels just right. So there's that um, both compulsion component in terms of the numbers needing it three times, and then that just right sensory drive um, or you might have, um, kids will describe having a physical movement or a, a noise in response to a thought or feeling that bothers them. And so again, this, you know, this is all Tourette's OCD, that latter one will sometimes call tickulsions, somewhere in between a tick and a compulsion. Um, and so jo just to reiterate, um, oftentimes we are working really, really hard to separate what's a tick, what's a compulsion, was it behavioral? Was it impulsive? Was it disinhibited? 
And so um, compulsions temporarily relieve the distress that's caused by an obsession. Ticks temporarily relieve the stress caused by this premonitory sensory urge. Impulse that you would see ADHD and in the circuitry in general, failure to stop oneself, um, that's like failure to inhibit a behavior um, motivated by reward. Again, think of like not being able to stop yourself from taking the extra cookie. And disinhibited is just simple failure to inhibit, regardless of the consequence. Um, blurting something out accidentally. Um, not having, people will say, you know, not having a great filter. It's, it's top-down cortical control is one term we use. Uh, it's basically acting without thinking. And, and these are all things that come up in, in kids, adolescents, and some adults with this Tourette OCD, and there's different treatments um, for each of them. And so does it matter? You know, is it hair splitting or is it helpful to parse these apart? So it does matter um, because it could affect the treatment. And as I previously mentioned, it's possible that sometimes SSRIs might be less effective in those that have the teretic OCD. Um, that doesn't mean they're ineffective. And in fact, what one often sees, and this is more experience, is that the SSRIs might help with the parts that appear more purely obsessive compulsive, but those ones that are more in the middle, the sensory driven ones, the tapping three times, those might need um, different treatment. So atypical antipsychotics, those are again, the aripiprazole, risperidone, those are the ones that have been shown in studies to be helpful. But we also know that alpha agonists, clonidine, guanfacine, can be used to treat um, ticks. And so if it's thought that it might be a more teretic OCD, off-label, one could try that first, um, always in um, the goal of trying to optimize and, and minimize medication. Um, and, and it helps to think um, in terms of the, the treatment, like the behavioral treatment, what is driving the behavior? That doesn't mean finding the fear behind something, because as we just talked about, it might not be driven by fear. It means more um, asking, is it a just not right? And then it might benefit from more habit reversal techniques. Um, and so that that's how it um, is really helpful to try to figure this out. And finally, I wanted to touch on um, something that is is scattered a little bit here and there in the literature, but that I see really, really often with all of the um, kids, teens, adolescents that I work with. And it's something that I've dubbed impulsive aggressive compulsions. And I most often, um, and there's evidence genetically too, that this might be related to what they call a disinhibited um, phenotype, seen when there's this combination of Tourette, OCD, and uh, ADHD impulsivity. And this is when the, the youth feels compelled to do the last thing that they, not the OCD or Tourette, wants to do. Um, so it'll be this intrusive, aggressive thought or an impulsive, aggressive thought, you know, hit, hit something. And then they will feel compelled to do it. And they will feel like if they don't, they will explode. And the examples I put might, um, if they are familiar, that's because I've had multiple people say these same ones. Um, so de-identified, um, a lot of people will say these, even though every child that has that often thinks that they're alone. And, you know, having to lick a car. Uh, or a window, um, having to push on a bruise, whether it's their bruise or someone else's bruise, uh, or while being in the middle of like a video game or computer game when they're about to win, turning off the game. And and so I see these a lot and, and I try to um, really make the point, it's not behavioral, it's ego dystonic. They don't want to be doing it. And that's what makes it more in this Tourette OCD ADHD category. And in order to treat it, you need a combination, education, behavioral, um, and, and pharmacological treatments often. And so just some um, clinical takeaways for, I wrote children, but really anyone, well, for the, some of them children with OCD. So sometimes kids will say that, um, quote, like a voice told me to do it. And when they're really little, they might not have a way to make sense of the fact that they know it's not them that wants it, this ego dystonic again. And so that's sometimes how they characterize it. Um, you know, obviously you would want to do, uh, you would want to meet with a psychiatrist if, if a child says that, but more often than not, it's, it's OCD than anything, um, not really worried about psychosis. Uh, very, 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 very rarely that that's the case. Much more often the case, it's OCD. Um, 
a child saying, I'm afraid I'm gonna hurt myself, um, but I don't want to, uh, what if I hurt myself? Um, and then often they might, uh, it might thought that they're suicidal and one um, always needs to assess for suicidality because we know that depression is associated with OCD. However, these thoughts are scary. They don't want them in their head. They're afraid they might act on it versus it being a sad, um, a, a sad or sort of more, you know, this is what I think I want thought. Parents will say things like, they tell me everything. I got the play by play of every moment of every interaction they had. That is a confessing ritual. Um, and, and reassurance seeking is another one super, super common. Are you sure it was okay? Yes. Are you sure we're going to do that? Yes. Are you sure we're going to do that? Yes. Um, and then finally, oftentimes, um, I'll ask the child, you know, if they get the, but what ifs. And so you'll say like, you know, they'll say, I'm afraid I'm going to, um, break my arm tomorrow. Well, you wouldn't do that. Like that, that doesn't make any sense. You're not going to be outside, but what if I fall? Well, I don't think that'll happen, but what if I do? And, and you get stuck in that loop that doesn't have an ending. And this is where the parent education component can be so helpful to help remove yourself from being engaged in these rituals. Um, it's, it's also really important to note that what you see on the outside, what a child is doing in terms of rituals might not be what's happening on the inside because oftentimes OCD is an internalizing disorder. And so it, it might be a lot more present than their voicing. So it's important. Again, this is evaluation. And then again, if there are symmetry compulsions, this touch one side needs to touch the other, think about ticks um, because as we've recently learned, that one um, tends to be more of ticks than OCD. And so, um, doo -doo -doo. yeah, that slide we already spoke about. And so thank you very much. And now I'll take a few questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Greenberg. So as she mentioned, we're now going to begin answering the questions that were submitted during tonight's presentation. If you have a question, please, as a reminder, you can still submit them through the questions pane on your control panel. If we are unable to get to everyone's questions, which is likely, here at the TAA, we do have a full-time information and referral staff who can answer your questions as well by emailing support at Tourette.org or calling one 888 for Tourette. You can also email webinars at Tourette.org and I would be happy to connect you with Dr. Greenberg if you had any further questions. So Dr. Greenberg, the first question we have is, do you often find Tourette-specific or Tourette -specific fears or, or obsessions? Example, thoughts. If you don't move the tissue box, I will tick and throw it. Or if I don't tie my shoe five times, my ticks won't let me put my foot down. Yeah, um, definitely. And that, that I mean, that sounds like a perfect example, actually, of that, that Tourettic OCD, where it's somewhere in between uh, a tick and a compulsion, and then they merge. And then in terms of the treatment, it, it can be helpful to tackle those um, in each of their respective um, uh, components. But, but that's a super, uh, things like that are, are uh, I see very often. Great, thank you. So the next question, should doctors who have patients with OCD look for teretic OCD indicators in case the patient has TS as well and is underdiagnosed? Um, yeah, I actually think that that's really important um, and less again because there's definitely going to be any difficulty or problem with the treatment, but more because sometimes if things aren't working, but that component of, of it is missed, that's why. And, and especially the younger the child is that has OCD, the more one should just keep an eye out um, for, for tics and tic disorders. And um, it's, you know, what's really, again, important is if a child has OCD and tics and the tics don't bother them, they don't get in the way, they don't cause trouble, you don't need to treat the tics. So, so the diagnosing of it isn't because the goal is then to try to treat every you know, condition they have, it's um, it's more just to to know that it might make sense to think about habit reversal, might make sense to think about alpha agonist, um, uh, just in terms of the conceptualization. And so that's why I think the education part, is, uh, part especially to pediatricians, other psychiatrists is so helpful um, because if they think if they do look out for that, that 
they know what else to look out for and you can get a more comprehensive picture. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question, what is special about hoarding? <clears throat> Why is it often excluded from this discussion or discussions? It's um, a big topic and um, hoarding is less my expertise than the, the other components. But one of the things that often happens is when they do the factor analyses and the genetic studies, hoarding ends up linking to a degree with OCD, but a, a big component of it is separate versus the other ones that tend to cluster more together. Interestingly, there's been some studies that hoarding might factor more with um, attentional processes, so ADHD, executive functioning. And so if, if a child, if a parent comes in and says that they're hoarding, I often, and I know they also have OCD, I'll always ask about attentional difficulties and executive functioning. And um, what I should clarify too, in children, when I'm thinking hoarding, I'm, I'm also thinking like of adults with their houses full and full and full of clutter. We know kids don't own their own property uh, and so that that wouldn't be possible. But sometimes, if it, even if it looks like hoarding, it's important to ask why they're saving the objects because it might be for a more typical OCD. I'm afraid if I don't keep 60 gum wrappers, my friend is going to get hurt tomorrow. So it, it's, it's also what's behind the symptom of it. Okay, next question. Would we expect to see more rage in a patient who has TS and OCD? Great question. Um, I would say, so complicated response, but basically the answer is yes. So I, I left that out in terms of that circuitry that I spoke about. So rage, uh, intermittent explosive disorder, basically going from zero to 100 is also implicated in that circuit. And so that's another thing that I always ask parents about of kids when I evaluate for OCD, because those kids do tend to be more reactive, impulsive, um, can have rage more often than kids without OCD. What we also know, which is just really tricky, is that the more, so if you have then Tourette and OCD, the more symptoms you have, the more symptoms you're likely to have. And so if someone has Tourette and OCD, it's, it's probably more likely, and again, there's spectrums for all of these, so it, even within that can range from mild to severe, but if one has Tourette and OCD, just by nature of, um, or actually this has now been shown more in studies, uh, you would be more likely to see more rage component than if it were just OCD without the Tourette. Great, okay, I'm gonna do a few more questions, so. Do tick disorders come before OCD develops? It depends. So the most common um, age that you'll see ticks is usually around 9, 10, 8, 9, 10. But in tick disorders, you, you some people see them as early as one. Um, oftentimes in a more Tourette, you'll see it at age five. And some people see OCD seven, eight. So it's it's I think it's whether or not it's more of a primary OCD with ticks or teretic OCD where you have the ticks first, either, either can come first. In general, you would probably see ticks before OCD if it's gonna be a more teretic picture. Okay, so next question. I'm curious how to shut down these what ifs that you had spoke about at the end. I know that engaging won't help, but it is so hard to shut it down, especially because range and emotional dysregulation is also associated. Yes, yes. And so one thing I also always tell the parent is this is why it's so important to have a therapist, a CBT therapist, ERP involved, because you can't be parent and therapist at the same time. And, and that's where the therapist often comes in and, and tries to give you workable tools to help reduce it. Um, when, you know, in an ideal situation, you would be able to say something like, all right, you're allowed five what ifs tonight, and then I'm walking away. Tomorrow night, you're allowed four, and I'm walking away. You know, okay, that's two. Okay, that's three. And then, you know, the next one, okay, what do you think I'm gonna say? And so it's not just stopping it, but it's, it's basically meeting them where they are and then pulling back, but always, or ideally with the help of a therapist or books. There's online, but you know, um, some are good as well, but a, a therapist is, is always exceptionally helpful. All right, we're gonna do two more questions. 
If we get good treatment for a child with OCD, could that prevent the possibility of tick manifestation? Probably not. I would say it's it's um, the better. So we know that ticks um, can people have different thresholds for ticks. So they used to say that medications like stimulants could cause ticks. The belief now is not that they cause them, but if you see ticks with them, it, it might have unmasked what was already there. So if one is going to develop ticks, they're probably going to develop ticks, but that doesn't mean the ticks are necessarily going to be severe. So I would still get full treatment, you know, great treatment for the OCD, but if ticks come, that doesn't mean it was a treatment failure. Great. Okay. And lastly, would you be able to speak about how to go about finding someone who is familiar with CBT for Tourette OCD? This person specifically um, talking about the Los Angeles area, but if you wanted to give everyone an idea about how to go about finding somebody. Ay, ay, ay. So that, that's the that's the hardest <laughs> question yet. <laughs> um, it's really hard, and I really think the more we can educate people about this, the the broader it will grow. I often mm -hmm. the goal that I recommend is if you find a treater that knows how to treat Tourette, they often know Tourette OCD. Those that treat OCD specifically don't always know about Tourette OCD, and so I often use the find a provider on the um, either the TAA website or there's the International OCD Foundation website, find a provider, and then it's asking them, you know, do you work with kids that have OCD and tics? How do you treat it? Um, but I, I know it's really hard and I'm hoping online tools are gonna be helpful soon as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, for, so for anybody listening, um, we do on the TAA website have the find a provider tool. It's very helpful, um, especially if you're located across the country, you can uh, filter it right down to your state to try and find somebody. Um, we do have people on there that are specifically treating for CBIT and all kinds of things. So please check that out. So to, that is all the time we have for questions. We weren't able to get to everybody. So please reach out to us. Like I said, email support at Tourette.org or webinars at Tourette.org and I would be happy to get that answer for you. So thank you again for a wonderful presentation, Dr. Greenberg. That's all the time we have for our webinar. Once the webinar is closed, all participants will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of tonight's webinar. Additionally, the webinar will be posted on the Tourette Association YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us on social media about this webinar or for any other ideas and suggestions you may have. So on behalf of the Tara Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. Have an excellent evening, evening everybody. Thanks, everyone.